All right, we're going to get started. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. We hope to be an incredible session. Um, my name is Tiffany Thompson. I am Senior Director of Global Partnerships and Equity at Echo and Green. Um, for those of you who do not know about Echo and Green, um, we are an uh, early stage uh, social innovation organization. And for over 30 years, we have been a leader in finding and supporting transformational leaders like Brandon and Charlotte here, um, who are at early stage and we invest deeply in their growth of their ideas and their leadership as they tackle some of the world's biggest problems. Really what we do best is build community. Um, we build community with folks who are committed to building um, a dynamic ecosystem and we support our fellows in their work now and long into the future. Um, and as we think about this work um, today, situated not only um, in this country, in the United States, but globally, um, there is a, a new conversation about what it means to innovate for Black futures, um, something that is not foreign to the United States and something that's not foreign to the continent. Um, we stand on the shoulders of giants like Elijah McCoy, Madam C.J. Walker, Garrett A. Morgan, Bell Hooks, Kimberly Crenshaw, just to name a few. And I am in front of what I believe to be three future ancestors who will um, be long, long remembered for their tireless work um, in communities that they call home. Um, so it is, with, it is my pleasure to be in conversation with these three brilliant leaders today um, and for you to hear from them about the work that they do, what brings them to this work and as we long um, sit here um, on the heels and in the middle of a global pandemic, um, um, in the middle of a country and a world um, beginning to reckon or continue to reckon with the ways in which race plays a part in all aspects of our lives, we'll, we'll dive into a conversation around what it means to be Black leaders doing this work in this, not only in this United States context, but outside of the United States where we know that anti-Blackness is rooted in all things. Um, and it continues to show up for leaders like the ones on the screen. But there's power within these communities. There is brilliance, there's abundance. Um, and there's a lot of navigation that must be required for those that look like Kelly, Charlotte, and Brandon as they do their work fighting for and with black folks, um, navigating a very biased uh, philanthropic space. Um, so I really am excited for this conversation and just want to begin um, with a few introductions from our folks, um, really leaning into a question around this notion of black genius. Um, many folks on this call, we all know that black leaders, like I just said, have always had the ideas and the innovations to reimagine and build the just system and world for all, right? And many of us on the screen, this work is personal. The black folks, we come to this work from a deep personal perspective of our people, our community, and that drives us to do this work every single day. So as you introduce yourself, tell us about who you are, the organization that you work for, and was there a leader or a movement or a blueprint that inspired your organization's vision? So I'll start with you, Charlotte. Um, thank you, Tiffany. Hello, everyone. My name is Charlotte Magai. I'm from Kenya. Um, I'm a environmentalist. So I run a company called Mukuru Clean Stoves and we recycle waste metal and use that to manufacture clean cook stoves. And then we partner with local women business owners to distribute our stoves to the last mile. And someone I am, I was inspired by and still am inspired by is um, Wangari Matai. She was um, um, a human rights and environmental activist. Um, she founded the Green Belt Movement. And um, apart from this fact that she was the first um, woman, black woman in East Africa to receive a Nobel Peace Prize, what she did with her movement was enable women to plant, you know, trees and um, basically fight for their human rights, fight for their rights to get to work. And um, even after she died, our work continued to carry on. And um, part of that is seen in the kind of work that we do as Mkuru, where we partner with women to kind of empower them to increase their household income and be empowered to make decisions for themselves. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much, Charlotte. I'll pass it to uh, Kelly. Thanks, Tiffany. 
Hello, Charlotte. Hey, Brandon. Hey, everybody who is who are joining us for this session. I'm so excited about the conversation. I'm Kelly Burton, and I am the executive director of the Black Innovation Alliance. It's a national coalition of innovator support organizations that exist to support small and medium-sized business owners, tech founders, and creative technologists. Currently, there are 65 organizations that are under the umbrella of BIA, and they support upwards of 300,000 entrepreneurs and innovators of color across the country. Uh, and this is such a great question. And um, uh, there are so many heroes and sheroes, right, um, who have contributed to our story. But one that comes to mind specifically for our work with Black Innovation Alliance is Walter White. And Walter White was an early executive secretary of the NAACP um, in the early 1900s, up with, all the way up to, I think, 1940s, 1950s. Um, and when we think about the civil rights, our struggle, the Black folk struggle in this country, that's like a lost era. It's like civil war, civil rights, nothing happened between the two. And it's like, no, there's a lot that happened. There were so many battles that were fought and won and a lot of it advanced by the NAACP. And what I really appreciated about Walter White's leadership was it was all so strategic and it was all so tactical. <laughs> like um, they didn't leave a whole lot to, to chance. Like they came buttoned up. And uh, in our work with BIA, that's really what we wanna bring, like the strategy, the tactics, the intentionality, the focus, the synergies. Um, so that our so that we're able to go further faster. Thank you so much for that, Kelly. And last but not least, uh, we'll throw it to Brandon Anderson. Thank you. Wow, it's such a pleasure to be here with y'all. I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> my name is Brandon Anderson. I am talking to you from Ohlone Land, otherwise known as Oakland, California, uh, and. A person who inspired me is not a well-known person, but he was the most important person to me in my life, uh, was my life partner, mm -hmm. and uh, who inspired me and catapulted me on this work. Um, I often tell the story of what it meant to first fall in love with my life partner, uh, and that was probably the most inspirational thing. The most inspirational moment of my life uh, that continues to play back. Uh, I fell in love for the very first time when I was 15 years old uh, to this tall, skinny, big headed black boy I first met in third grade English class. <laughs> and I joke about this, but so true. Like, I didn't even mean to fall in love with this dude. <laughs> when I was 16, 17 years old, it was like falling asleep in class. You know, it's like the thing you don't really mean to do, but you just end up waking up and you're like, I did it. Uh, and in 2007, uh, my fiance and life partner was killed by police during a routine traffic stop. Uh, his love was radical, unapologetic, and it continues to change my life. Uh, in so many ways. And so it catapulted me into the work I do now. Uh, I founded Rahim in memory of my partner. Rahim is the first and only independent service for reporting police in the United States since 2017. And we're known for two things. We've been known for running a website that makes it easy and safe for victims to report police violence and get access to resources for justice and healing. And because the person, police officer who killed my partner, um, the police department made it such a difficult uh, time in reporting cops. By design, the second thing we are known for is we have collected reports about how police behave now in more than 250 cities in the United States and have developed one of the largest police data sets, <clears throat> excuse me, data sets on the performance of police in the United States. Uh, and that has led us to uh, also examine how we can deliver need and aid to communities uh, in need. And so we are building an alternative dispatching system to 911 to end 
the existence of police by 2030 in the United States. Happy to get into that. <laughs> Thank you so much to Brandon, Charlotte, and Kelly for um, leading us off in a, in a space of inspiration, um, humility, and really vulnerability. Um, you know, a part of this conversation is rooted in like inspiration that brings us to this table, right? We come to this work um, with a moral obligation for all of us to work for and with our people. Um, but alongside of that comes a lot of disparities as we as Black folks drive social innovation ventures throughout a really biased um, philanthropic space. Um, in 2020, Equin Green released a report alongside the Bridge Brand Group that demonstrated this very same notion that revenues of the Black-led organizations within our portfolio had 24% smaller revenues than their, their white-led counterparts. Um, and when we looked at unrestricted asset nets, it was the, the assets of Black-led organizations were 76% smaller than white-led organizations. We know that this type of funding, particularly unrestricted funding, is often a proxy for trust. And this funding assumes that the donor does not trust the leader to use the funds in the way that they will achieve the greatest impact. And when funders put larger restrictions on funding, that is often a proxy, like I said, for lack of trust. So when we think about the work that you guys are doing in your communities, it's much more than that, right? There's abundance and joy in our communities. There is brilliance and, and activism and community organizing happening. But oftentimes when we step into the room fighting for the people in which we love, um, there's deficit frameworks in, in, in that. There's a, a particular notion to what a black leader should look like. So when you enter into these rooms, particularly in this moment now where folks are beginning to care out loud for black people, what do you think is left on the table when you're continuing to navigate the space, understanding the bias that is continuing to happen for people that look like you. And what is the what can we talk about in terms of what is left behind? What is the what is the brilliance that is left on the table when we don't fund Charlotte, when we don't fund Kelly, and we don't fund Brandon um, at the same equitable rate that our white counterparts are funded? I'll throw it to you, Kelly, first. Oh, Brandon, I see you unmuting. Go right ahead. I, yeah, uh, what are we leaving on the table? Um, that's a hard question, but an easy question in so many ways. Um, it's an easy question because I've often been the person left at the table, right? And it's a hard question because I try not to think about all that has lost. Uh, in between that time, because otherwise I'm overwhelmed with my work uh, and the barriers to get there. But I am reminded of somebody in my life <clears throat> who, who challenges me on a daily basis, and it's my younger sister. <laughs> uh, and I, I, when I think of her, I think of this quote, she ain't got kids, but I think of this quote often um, another friend of mine said is that it's nothing more innovative than a black woman raising six kids on $18,000 a year. Uh, and me and my sister were one of those six kids. Uh, and I just see so much innovation in my sister on a daily basis. My sister is uh, 31 and she was 28 when she was first diagnosed with breast cancer. And when she first got diagnosed with breast cancer, I paused my work. I flew to New York for a few weeks and I made sure she was taken care of during her surgery. That when she had a chemotherapy session, people were present with her. And uh, about a year ago, I got a call from her and said, hey, Brandon, I wanna pick a bone you know, we from we from the country. I don't know where y'all from, but we from Oklahoma. And picking a bone mean basically like I have something I want to talk to you about that I've been you know mulling over. And this conversation said, you know, she said, "Hey, I, you know, I wanted you to stop everything you were doing. Uh, I wanted you to stop your. I wanted to put. I wanted you to put your relationship on pause. I wanted you to quit your job." I wanted you to break your lease and pick your entire life up and move it from Oakland, California to New York City 
where I am a where I am a single woman living by myself away from all of our family. And I need you to be here. I needed you to be here until you know until I no longer needed you. Mm-hmm. And uh, I that was really a hard pill for me to swallow. And my I talk a lot of stuff over with my best friend. And I asked him and he said it sounded unreasonable. You know, did that sound unreasonable? And I'm reminded of that term a lot. Did that sound unreasonable? And it caught me just like that. Was that reasonable? And I'm an abolitionist. And so I'm often fed that line often. Is that a reasonable thing to do? Should we reasonably negotiate our conflict with care and not violence instead of police? Is that a reasonable thing we can ever achieve? I'm often asked. And so After further reflection on that, I asked my sister, why did you wait so long to tell me about what was going on? And she was like, I'm a black woman. I've lived my entire life needing to shrink the smallest in every room throughout every one of my relationships. I didn't know how to ask you for what I wanted. And that was about a year ago and so much healing has happened since then. I think that when you, what we leave on the table is when we don't invest in people like my sister and people like the beautiful black woman on this call, you get reasonable solutions. Mm -hmm. You get solutions that seem reasonable, but don't necessarily address the real need. And my sister kept asking me, I'm really glad my sister stopped asking me about what was asking me for what was reasonable. And she started asking me for what she needed to heal. I think that the black people on this call and black people who are doing this work are not asking for what's reasonable any longer. Mm -hmm. And so what's being left on the table is reasonable solutions. Excuse me, what's being left on the table is unreasonable solutions to problems that have plagued black communities um, <laughs> due to anti-blackness and the conflict that you know oftentimes these folk at the table or the table itself is created. And, and so I, I think uh, if anything, I, I, I'd say that's something that's certainly left on the table. I, I love the, the concept of, of a reasonable. Um, and having to justify it in a frame that has often wanted us to minimize. Um, opening it up for Kelly or Charlotte for any further reflections on that point as well. Yeah, you know, um, I think about James McCune Smith, who was the first university trained black physician in the early 1800s, and how he literally had to go to Glasgow to get trained because no American university would accept him, despite the fact that he was brilliant. He came back from Glasgow, one of the first university trained statisticians in the Western hemisphere and could not get a job and had to open up a small practice and close out his career working in a foster home. Hmm. One of the most brilliant minds in the Western hemisphere could not get a university position. Right. I think about Pauli Murray, who essentially wrote the Bible. They call it the Bible of economic, um, the the piece of research that Thurgood Marshall used when they essentially argued Brown versus Board of Education was written by a black woman, Pauli Murray, who was Ivy League trained and could not get a job as a law clerk. Mm. Right? So we are born with equal measures of genius. Just because black folks don't get the opportunity to display and demonstrate our genius in the ways that our white counterparts and other people of color do, because let's be clear, there is a social hierarchy, there is a caste system in this country and black people are on the bottom. White folks are on the top and everybody else is mixed up in there somewhere in between, right? Um, And so if we see disparities, if we see Differences in performance is not because the potential is not equal. The potential is there. The opportunity is missing. So in terms of the, what, what we forego, yes, it's what we forego as a black, what is foregone as a black community, but it's really what is foregone as a global society. Because what could James McCune Smith had done if he had the resources to really carry forward 
his genius and to contribute in the ways in which he was capable. Mm -hmm. What is society foregone? You know, what cures did we not get an opportunity to access? What research has never gotten done? You know, one thing that we know about markets, when they are closed, when they're protected, when there's limited competition, there's underperformance. And what we have seen in this society is a protected economy where black folks are always the last to get hired, the first to get fired. Mm -hmm. And certain classes are protected. White men in large part are protected. You know, there's been a protectionism that has been created where white men were filtered up to leadership and white women, the secretarial roles and black people, the menial roles. And again, everybody else filters somewhere in between. It wasn't based on ability. It was based on caste. And we have to appreciate and understand that. So the loss is not just for black people. The loss is for global society. It's for the world. Unless we get it right, we're going to continue to retard our growth, our evolution as a global society. Love that. And I mean, that's such a great segue to Charlotte, who sits <laughs> in Kenya, um, who has, you know, a perspective of sitting on the continent doing this work that oftentimes the, the conversation of anti-Blackness does not get to the continent. They don't see it in that frame, right? But Charlotte sits squarely in that. So we'd love to hear some reflections from you as well, Charlotte. I think I was very excited to go on after Kelly because when she was speaking, I think about what Brian said about reasonable solutions. And what happens is when we do not get the resources or the financing that we need um, to work on unreasonable solutions, which, which is what would solve the problems, we end up working under these people who are funded to accelerate the distribution of reasonable solutions that then ends up putting us back in the circle. Like it's a 360 turn because we are back to the same problem. We didn't solve it because we tried to use a very reasonable solution that was never meant for the problem in the first place. And we see that with a lot of brilliant black, especially female founders here in Kenya or around East Africa, who are just, they're just so smart. They're just so eloquent. They speak like um, Kelly. And what happens is they're going to start a company. It is brilliant. There's just one radical thing about it. Their business model works with women who a funder is going to assume is too hard to reach, so they don't want to fund that. So they end up becoming an operations manager in an organization that has the same solution minus that radical change. So um, that is something that... I just thought about right now when Kelly was talking and it scared me a little bit to think that I have had that information, but it's never registered until now. No, thank you for that. I mean, what we're talking about here is power, right? Um, and Dr. King once said, power is the ability to achieve a purpose. Whether or not it is good or bad depends on the purpose. And often we see power at work in very direct and obvious ways. And at the same time, power operates in less obvious ways, even in hidden ways through cultural norms, ideas and practices that perpetuate existing power relations that discourage questions about the challenges to that power relation. So as um, marginalized folks, given the context of colonialism, white supremacy and all the things that impact our communities, but also folks who are rooted in brilliance and joy and humility, um, how can we preserve ownership and representation um, within these spaces as we drive our innovative solutions when institutions work to erase that? What are the tools that you walk into rooms with um, while navigating this space um, to own your work, to own the funding that supports that innovative support um, while combating uh, this, this particular space when they are trying to erase your power, um, trying to erase your approach um, and your work? Whoever wants to go first, no, no, don't jump at once. Okay, um, I'm gonna go first since I'm not on me anymore. I think um, it would help if um, some black founders learned not to give up, you know, a piece of the pie too fast, especially early on when you're really desperate for someone to finance you and you just, you're ready for them to come on board, you know, if you, you're happy, they've bought into, um, 
your idea and the key word for tonight for me would be reasonable again or un- rather unreasonable and what that does for you is basically a seduction you know they um, someone talking to you about what you could do if you just turn it down a little bit so that it fits you know everybody's um i guess um like requirements so you're able to get the the partners that you need so it waters down the impact that you are going to create so my advice is to really hold on um um to that, that entire pie until you really have to give it out and when you have the power to give it out with your own terms i think every time um an investor has done due diligence on my business and they see that i still maintain 100% ownership if it's a black woman they always notice and they applaud me for it everybody else doesn't pay attention to it but most times there is a black woman asking you how did you manage to do that i applaud you for that because these are chances they do due diligence on so many um you know organizations they've seen that the people who give out too much power too soon lost out on the authenticity of their movement so my advice is to just hold on to it it's really hard especially because we have to struggle we are always competing with each other to get financing that some of our counterparts don't even have to compete for they just have to say hello to the right person so try as much as possible and getting on to programs like the co green that just really remind you of who you are of what you're trying to do and why you need to keep sticking to it so hold on to that pie and feel it's really time to let it go and it's for good i guess reason or returns I I absolutely love that and Charlotte you have I mean I I'm uncertain where you are in your entrepreneurial journey um like in where I am but I wish you would have told me that so much earlier <laughs> uh or that I had to learn that so much earlier um uh, something that really stuck with me and that Tiffany was saying is about how power can be used whether good or bad like power is used to achieve a particular in and and oftentimes that power is used and it it encourages you to not think about the way that power is used against you so much so that you can interrogate it to some degree and so it doesn't give you that space or the opportunity to even reflect on how that power is consuming your life or the life of 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 your loved ones and i often think about like how police do that but I th- I thought also about like how how capitalism can do that because we are you know we're this I mean really to bring this to bear like we're having conversations about uh you know raising money <clears throat> from foundations that generally are housing money that's been given to them to manage or to distribute by multi-million or billionaires uh who have no doubt reached that level of uh financial uh stability <laughs> uh due to the uh grave and massive levels of exploiting black labor um because that's what white supremacy is the pur- the purpose of it is to maximize the utility of the nigger and insert the nigga can be anybody it can be the black person at the very bottom of the pole like kelly said or any other nigga in between if they even when they you know even when you white uh and you poor i mean to some degree uh i think that the idea here is um like what sort of tools have we have i been able to use i can just give you some insight from my perspective my relationship with funders generally there are a couple of things just getting down to practicality that i just uh i think are important when you are a funder or founder i mean when you are a founder and executive director talking to foundations or major individual donors and when you're talking with a foundation it's important to uh set a timeline for me foundations take incredibly just way too long uh, like uh, being killed by the police is the sixth leading cause of death for young black men in America they are killed less they are killed every uh less than 
every every 24 hours. I don't have 18 months to wait on you to negotiate whether you can deliver a $250,000 grant, right? And, that's and so enough. what I, <laughs> yeah, and that's still not enough. And so what, I, what I've done is I put together these funding salons that take place and in order, and so we're building an alternative dispatching system to 911. We will give the funders who wanna be a part of that, we will share with them 80% of what they need to know and learn before they get in the room, right? So whatever questions or any things that they have that they wanna know about, we can get them that. They have to come to the funding salon. It's an, you know, in this case, it's a, it's a virtual invite only 15 funder cap. We, uh, when it gets out of this pandemic, we'll broaden it, we'll, we'll widen it to in person every quarter. But the goal is we have four of those a year. We're gonna, we're gonna cap it at 15 funders a quarter. We'll teach you 80% of what you need to know before you get in the room or the virtual session. 20% of it will be, will be talked about from, from the team in the virtual, uh, the 90 minute virtual funding salon. And then you will only be able to join if you can commit to funding or excuse me, making a funding decision, making a decision, a commitment or a, a no, whatever it is, a final decision within 90 days from the date of that funding salon. So foundations uh, every quarter have an opportunity at 15 at a time to get to invest in Raheem and this opportunity, but they have to make a decision before the next um, funding salon. And that's an opportunity. That's really like a, it, have you ever seen like those Anyways, I, I watch a bunch of cinema. Um, so I'm going to say that out loud because they all probably like, they probably, everybody going to probably like, no. But 300 is a really old, old movie. And it's it's a fairly violent movie. And so it's, it's fair if you've never seen it, you're not missing a lot. Um, but in 300, they had this space where they kind of like, the whole idea of 300 was that they were able to beat the, you know, not beat, but come close to beating much of the Greeks because they were able to, use their numbers for them and work in the space they were in. Um, and so we're, I'm just trying to create like a space that is like the idea is to create an exclusive space where you get to make the rules and funders have to listen to you. Like that's just flat out. Like, like that is no secret. Like, like you have to be the driving decision maker because like funders are just managing billionaires money trying to offload it to avoid taxes and you're trying to uh like i don't know uh <laughs> save millions of lives with whatever technology or whatever solution you're building and like it's just not the same so i feel like founders slash executive directors should really be in that in that driver's seat when it comes to that timeline thank you so much brandon kelly if you have anything we can I'll pass it. Okay. <laughs> You're like, nope, you said all the things. Um, I'm very conscious of time. Um, I want to just maybe toss out, I have two more questions, but also want to be mindful of anyone that has a question in the chat. Um, Marissa, I do see your question, so I will get to that. Um, I want to leave, sort of lean us into um, what does it look like to pay me in equity, right? Like, what is that future? Um, that you are building for black folks, whether it's through the economy or the community. Um, and what do you need? What is the money monetary that you need to get to the future that you dream of? Far too often, I was in a room with one of our fellows, um, uh, no, was it Lauren, Teresa Hodge, um, that told me, um, co-founder of R3 Score, um, that told me that for the first time in over her, I don't know, five, seven year journey of being an entrepreneur, somebody finally asked her, what do you need? And have we as black folks have the ability to say, this is what I need and I need it now. What do you need, Brandon? What do you need, Charlotte? What do you need, Kelly, to build that future um, that we so imagine and dream of? Um, and what do you hope to leave these folks leave this room with knowing that you need that work? What is the door that they have to open up for you what is the door that they have? What is the email that they need to send on behalf of people that look like you? What is the inequitable practices that need to be stopped? What is it that you need to do your work? 
I'm going to give it to Kelly first. I, you know, at the Black Innovation Alliance, um, our goal is to bring 500 organizations under the umbrella of BIA, support 1 million innovators of color across the country, and direct $1 billion of investment to the ecosystem that exists to support Black entrepreneurs and innovators. So that's what we tell folks we need. That's absolutely what we believe we need. But, you know, there's a scripture, there are several scriptures in the Bible that talk about the Holy Spirit intervening for us because we don't know what we need. <laughs> and that's the truth, right? Sometimes I just got the call on the Holy Ghost, like, Holy Ghost, help me out because I'm probably lowballing over here. And mm -hmm. because Black folks have been so used to scrimping and scraping and being resourceful because we got two nickels to run to rub together and we got to save all the people um, for all the things, right? And so it forces us to really sometimes not even know how much is necessary in order for us to move the needle. So that's kind of where we are. You know, this is a big number. We could do a whole lot with that big number. But chances are we don't we don't even have a clue <laughs> um, because what we have been given access to is so limited in light of what is necessary in order to correct what has been broken. Mm -hmm. Right. Talk about inclusion, black inclusion, black inclusion for the last 20 years, exclusion for the last 400. <laughs> I mean, literally, like, mm -hmm. how do you fight black? Right, black exclusion for hundreds of years, and then be fatigued when we've talked about it for a good 18 months. Like, and that's what we're trying to unpack. That's what we're trying to figure out. So I say one of the things we absolutely need is we need funders to invest in creating space to allow black people to dream, mm -hmm. give us resources to heal, give us resources to be together to love on each other, to be in community, right? Um, that's what we need. Because we would love to, you know, create the next scooter, but we can't think about creating the next scooter because we're trying to figure out how we ensure that Black men don't get shot down in the midst of a traffic stop. So all of our brain space is occupied solving social issues. We like to play too, but we don't have the wherewithal to play because we have to fix stuff that's been broken by folks who don't look like us. <laughs> I love that you said that and then muted yourself, okay? That was that was typical black woman comment. Oh, Charlotte, I see you <laughs> muted yourself. Go right ahead. <laughs> I think she just did a mic drop on us, yes. um, but <laughs> because um, what happens is she just said that she doesn't know what she needs. And for me, I would say, because I'm not asked that question often, I would throw it back to the people I'm trying to look for financing for. Like, what do you really need? Because they say they want impact. They want a financial return. And you promise that. And they still don't give you what you say you need. So my question to them is, what do you really need? Because if financial return or, or social impact is what you're looking for from a black female founder in Africa, then I would suggest you trust female black founders, like give us the resources that we need, take a bit of a step back and then watch us give you what you need. If it is really what you need, because sometimes I'm, I'm suspecting that it's not exactly what you're saying because we're giving you the right numbers. We're telling you this is what we're going to achieve. And if I'm communicating that in five years, if I'm able to distribute 500,000 clean cookstops to low-income households in Kenya, then I will enable these families to save $50 million in fuel consumption costs. That is your impact. So why am I struggling to raise money? So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand what are you looking for because I feel like what I think you're looking for is not right. And we need to kind of communicate on that and figure out what each of us need and see if there is even a fit for us to work together. But my thing is trust um, female black founders in Africa. We do not want to work, you know, behind um, other founders who've come to solve problems that we've already been solving 
without any help. We don't want to work for them. We want to solve our own problems. We have the brains to do it. We have the passion to do it. We just need a bit of resource here and there. And for, for the longest time, we thought that, you know, our visions are aligned. But if there aren't, then really tell us what you need as a founder. Amen. I love that. Just amen. Yeah. Amen to that. Amen to that. Brandon, you got less than a minute and a half. <clears throat> I, okay, I'll make that quick. The question about what we need to fund the alternative dispatching system to 911. Uh, we're raising $5 million to do it. And uh, we've uh, raised two and a half already. We need another two and a half million dollars by, uh, by the end of next year in order to build the technical and organizational infrastructure for a world without police. Uh, and that includes when I say technical infrastructure, I mean a dispatching system that will dispatch the already pre-existing life-affirming services and organizations delivering those services across the country, but that currently operate outside of the dispatching system because of politics, police unions, and policies that prohibit it. And so they are already working to deliver life-affirming services to communities. They are only using a 10-digit local phone number these organizations are either county or institutionally funded. They are delivering uh, mental health care, domestic violence care. They are responding to quality of life infractions. They are responding to sexual and patriarchal violence. These organizations are responding to homelessness. These are organizations that are truly meeting the needs of community and meeting conflict with care instead of <clears throat> instead of violence and we believe that they require uh, more technical infrastructure and by organizational infrastructure we are going to fund these organizations right now there is a certain number of mobile crisis teams in the united states we want to triple that number from 50 to 150 and by 2030 we want more than 20,000 safety teams that are delivering life affirming services in lieu of 911 and the police. So in order to do that, we need $5 million to run a pilot because uh, California is gonna be the first state we take over. Uh, and then the second thing we need is, uh, I'm looking for someone who, uh, I, I need to talk to people about boards. Um, we're looking to fill one last board seat and um, there's that. So I'm looking for a treasurer. <laughs> That's a very specific thing that I need um, is a treasurer for the board. So. If you go with numbers and you down the hill. Yeah. Thank you so much to Brandon, Kelly, and Charlotte for um, sharing their brilliance today with us. There's never enough time um, to be in community with you all. Um, can you quickly in the chat, Brandon, Kelly, and Charlotte, put your contact information? I know folks want to learn more about your work with where they can reach you. We'll drop that in the chat. Um, and Marissa, I do see your question around de risking. Um, I want to turn the question back on you and the rest of the audience is, whose job is it to name risk? Is the risk the investment in Black folks? Is the risk taking money from organizations that align with our values? And why do we does philanthropy find it risky to invest in folks that are building solutions that shouldn't even be something, that shouldn't even be reasonable, that shouldn't even be the thing, right? Like, who is defining that? So I'll leave you with that conversation around, let's rename what we call risk and let's uplift what we call trust. Um, because I'm reading a book uh, by the autobiography of Asada and I'll leave you guys with this. She, she talks about uh, trust. Um, and look, I'm gonna lose it in my time. But what we wanted to do today was we wanted to believe in living. We wanted to believe in birth and we wanted to believe in the sweet love and in the fire of truth. As Black folks, we continue to sit in our truths um, no matter what. Um, and we leave you guys uh, hopefully inspired uh, to support these three brilliant leaders and to make a difference in the rooms that you go into because you don't step in there alone. Um, and I ask that you step in there with Brandon in mind, you step in there with Charlotte in mind, and you step in there with Kelly in mind because they step in for communities that look like them. So I hope you do the same too. Thank you all. Thank you.
Thanks, everybody. Yes, thank y'all. So beautiful. Thank y'all.